Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Before introducing today's guest, I want to alert listeners that there's a special postscript at the end of this week's episode where I reflect on some of the empirical issues that came up during the conversation. So after I thank my guests, please stay tuned for some thoughts on risk, health, and data that are really important. Today is October 22nd, 2015, and my guest is Robert Aronowitz. He is a physician, the chair of the Department of History and Sociology of Science at the University of Pennsylvania, and his latest book, Risky Medicine, Our Quest to Cure Fear and Uncertainty, is the subject of today's episode. Robert, welcome to Econ Talk. Great to be here. What is risky medicine? Well, I mean the term to cover a few different things that I, uh, I think characterize a lot of modern medicine. Um, for one, it's risk-centered medicine. That is medicine that's um, focused on reducing the probabilities of some bad outcome as opposed to medicine that is any kind of medical intervention that's there to treat symptoms or um, change the pathophysiological process that's doing harm in the body. Um, and there are a number of aspects of risky medicine that go along with that risk-centeredness, uh, in particular the way in which we think about the efficacy, you know, uh, how we know something works in medicine has shifted in many cases from, you know, seeing a disease disappear or symptoms get resolved or uh, people living longer lives to um, looking for intermediate endpoints of reduced, uh, you know, probability, reduced probabilities of some bad outcome happening. You know, you're, you're better because your cholesterol is 150 when it used to be 200 or your blood pressure is 110 when it used to be 140. And, and a third element of risky medicine, you know, and this, you know, I'm obviously a little bit playful with the title in the sense that some of these things are also dangerous, but it's not my primary intention in calling the book risky medicine. But a third element is the fact that we live in a world where there's um, much more profit to be made when um, pharmaceutical companies and uh, uh, device makers and medical specialists develop interventions that reduce risk. And what I mean by that is um, in the old days, uh, I, I, there's an anecdote that I have in the book from uh, actually somebody else who um, um, talks about a 1950s pharmaceutical convention of, of different uh, drug companies. And someone got up and gave a speech and said, um, we've done really well with our new antibiotics, but we have a very, very bad business model. We have products that immediately consume their demand. You know, people are better and they stop buying our project. We've our products. We've got to figure out a better way. And if we fast forward to the present, a better way has been figured out. Uh, if you have drugs or interventions that promise to treat risk, people are uh, possibly, yeah, possibly the whole population uh, could have even some small probability of a, of a bad outcome and be the market for a disease. And they might need to take this drug or intervention their entire life. So um, that's a sort of third element of what I mean by risky medicine. It's certainly uh, the case that in a world where often we're paying, we're, we're consuming products using other people's money, third-party payments in the medical area, that right. combined with the profit motive leads to a pretty unhealthy uh, dynamic of uh, pushing products that people think, well, couldn't hurt, better safe than sorry. And, and your book, to a large extent, is uh, – you could have called it better safe than – the dangers of better safe than sorry, not a good title. But but that's really, I think, part of, of what, you're, uh, what you're exploring here, the – natural impulse that human beings have to avoid danger and then the opportunity yes. to have somebody else pay for a chance to reduce the risk, not necessarily the actual effect of it, which is what I think is, is your deep insight. We're often not right. getting healthier. We're, quote, reducing the risk, which they're not the same thing, are they? No, they're not the same thing. I mean, um, it's, it's something of a complicated argument in that 
you know, whether or not an intervention works according to what we might think of as the highest standard of scientific efficacy, you know, proven in a randomized clinical trial to improve lifespan or reduce uh, morbidity, um, pr whether that kind of evidence exists behind a practice, it's not necessarily the reason why people take it or doctors prescribe or, um, or use an intervention. There's often an element of what I call psychological or social efficacy at work. Um, you know, I'm better safe than sorry, capture some of that. That is, often things are done because, you know, they may have some, you know, stated objective um, benefit on health, but un the underlying logic of why a, um, a product is used may have another reason. Now, this is most clearly seen, however, obviously, in, in, in practices that there's lots of evidence that there's not much um, benefit. So things like um, routine fetal heart monitoring in, in, in quote unquote normal labor. You know, there's been a lot of studies that have shown that there aren't really any um, uh, significant health benefits to, you know, you know what I'm talking about this when you yes. say, you know, a woman's in labor and, you know, kind of a microphone goes on the belly and the heart rate is, is, um, is measured and you have a continuous sort of feedback loop uh, hearing. And it's very reassuring to people. Of course, it's reassuring only until this starts decelerating and everybody gets, um, scared, but that, well, I'll, I'll bracket that point for a second. Um, there's a lot of evidence that that really it doesn't improve outcomes. It leads to a lot more C-sections. Oh, yeah. And, and I, there are I, ma ma many, many expert panels get up and pronounce, you know, this evidence and, and recommend we must do something about reducing the amount of C-sections, and we, we, we should probably find a way of getting rid of routine fetal uh, um, heart monitoring, but it never happens. Well, because you feel like yeah. it's – I mean I've, I found that to be a very fascinating example. It's typical of a number of the examples of the book. <clears throat> there are other different kinds as well, but this particular kind, on the surface, yeah. there's no side effect from it. It's just – it's harmless. I mean you're not hurting the child. You're not hurting the, the, the fetus. And similarly, when you do a blood test of a particular kind, there's no – you're already taking the blood. So if you check for your uh, – the healthier prostate, there's no there's no harm done there. But the real side effect, and this is, I think, one of the most powerful lessons of your of your work, is that that leads to often a chain of events that's particularly unattractive, although seemingly inevitable. And it's funny you mentioned the the fetal heart monitoring. Our first yeah. child, um, the heart rate dropped precipitously uh, during my wife's labor, and our main doctor had not arrived yet. And the um, the intern who was there uh, said, "We have to do a C-section. We have to prepare you for a C-section." And uh, we weren't very happy about that, and, but it's mm -hmm. it's not a place of calm decision making. You know, it's something like, well, I don't no, know. No, not at not at all. There was you know panic in the air on on everybody's part, uh, and including the, the the doctor who was on on call on duty then. And uh, fortunately, our doctor arrived in time before anything was done, and said, "Oh well, she, she had a contraction, and the heart rate dropped, and now it's back to normal. It's fine, <laughs> and nothing happened." But yeah. we were very close to having. A C-section that was prob not probably, certainly not necessary and would have added additional uh, harm to my wife. Yeah, and uh, to sort of follow that through a little bit, um, if you had a, you know, a good outcome uh, with the C-section, I, I hope you had a good outcome with the regular vaginal delivery. We did. Um, it's a little self-reinforcing too. Of course. Because – you know, things worked out well. It, it probably was the right decision. You know, we, we don't tolerate a lot of cognitive dissonance. And there's something I call in the book the um, the elephant in green pajamas problem. Yeah, tell and, that story. Uh, uh, well, it's it's a stupid joke. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn, and we would tell these. Um, you know, I guess we were developing each other's sense of irony. Uh, these uh, jokes that didn't have powerful punchlines, but the, the story went: you know, one kid says to the other, "Why do elephants wear green pajamas?" And the other kid says, "I don't know." And uh, the person telling the story says. To camouflage, so elephants can camouflage themselves on pool tables. And the other guy has this puzzled look and says, what? Uh, and the storyteller goes on, have you ever seen an elephant on a pool table? You see it works. Yeah. And, you know, there's, you know, in many cases, the absence of something bad happening is putative evidence that something works. And um, somebody who's had a screening test and early... And on the basis of that, some early precancer diagnosis and then surgery and chemotherapy for that problem and lives to tell the story 10, 20 years later feels they 
dodged a bullet and, um, you know, there was efficacy to it. And which may be true. It, which it could be true, but that's, you know, the, 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 um, you know, I'm a big proponent in, in having really good evidence. Sometimes people misunderstand my cynicism about yep. the way actual decisions get made to be uh, an argument for, you know, letting a thousand flowers bloom when I think, you know, to degree, degree possible, we, we should try to find, uh, you know, you, you can't model every medical decision. Uh, and there's a lot of idiosyncrasy in people's bodies and circumstances that make the application of aggregate data to any one individual difficult. But those things, be, you know, aside, it's really important to um, get evidence. But, you know, I, I guess, you know, just to start in the beginning of your question of a few minutes ago when you said, you know, a blood test is only information or the heart, you know, the heart monitor isn't harming the baby kind of thing. You know, my, I guess I've been sensitized and my hair stands on end when I hear that kind of thing because um, it's like, it's just as you said, it's not the information that's dangerous. Of course, in some things like mammography, you could have some radiation risk, but you know, for the most part, it's what that information does and how, and how it triggers like your intern in the middle of the night uh, almost had his way, you know, triggers some unnecessary intervention. Um, and I guess the other thing I've been, the other thing about just information that is worrisome is that a lot of our, you know, in, in as much as I'm making an argument that a lot of our screening tests, the fetal heart monitor we just talked about, serve the psychological function to control our fears and reduce uncertainty, you need to ask the question, where did the fears and uncertainty come from in the first place? You know, not, you know, we all fear death and there's some parts of the human condition that fear disease, but many of the things we do exaggerate or complicate those fears. And it's often those very things that also have a role in controlling fear. So, for example, screening mammography historically is behind, that is, it's the cause of, in many ways, the rapidly rising incidence of breast cancer diagnoses through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, it detected a lot more cancers, and many more people were treated, and the prevalence of cancer increased. You know, at the, and at that same moment, people fear the disease more because there's just more of it. It seemed like everybody, everybody, everywhere you look, cancer is there. But one of the antidotes to that fear is to go get yourself screened, which produces more people, you know, who, with a diagnosis. So there's a kind of, um, and this is true in a lot of screening tests, and it actually is true of the development of a lot of public health programs around that used fear as a motivator in even the early part of the century. There's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy or a, autocatalytic reaction that feeds on itself aspect of things. That's um, something I identified in the book and in most of my previous work on breast cancer that's, that's very troubling. So, so the challenge is, and I, and I face the same issues as you do in economics because I'm a big skeptic yeah. about some right. of the empirical claims that economists make and the precision of it and the science claims about it. And, and then people say, well, you don't, you're not interested in evidence. Well, yes, I am. I'm yeah. interested in you're not you're, you're anti-science. No, no, actually, I'm pro-science. I'm in favor of good evidence. I'm just not in favor right. of bad evidence. So the alternative, when you say things like, "Oh, this <clears throat> this encouragement of mammography and, and screening, and it's across many other diseases," that's led to this epidemic in some ways of cancer, but that was there anyway, and so. A lot of people say, well, the alternative is just, to, okay, so I'm not going to get tested. I'm, I don't want to know that I have it. It's better to, better to be uh, ignorant. Ignorance is bliss. And, of course, that's not what you're encouraging either, and it's certainly uh, not, a, not a scientific attitude. But I think that's for human beings <laughs> as opposed to, quote, scientists. I think the real challenge we face as decision makers is, is, is between those two poles – Oh, I'd rather not know because it's going to lead to a bunch of awful stuff I don't want to have done right. that might not work versus, well, I might be at risk of death. It's better to find out and solve the problem. So, you know, I, there are a couple of things. First, I think we need the best possible evidence there is, uh, which means investing in knowledge production in the form of clinical trials, especially of new preventative measures and some type of discipline as a society either through insurance companies or government regulation or the morality of individual investigators to not just do something that just seems like just information as we were talking about or like self-evidently effective without much harm, um, you know, which has been the way many um, preventative practices, risk-reducing practices have actually been introduced. 
in a kind of evidence-free way. So I, I think you know it's a clear argument for a high bar of scientific evidence. At the same time, I wouldn't dismiss it, uh, dismiss the, you know, bury your head in the sand psychology of wanting peace of mind as some, you know, pole of human psychology that shouldn't be listened to. I think when, when we're talking about screening tests and uh, proactive things that medicine decides we're going to find something in people's bodies, I think the actual ethics uh, for the doctor-patient relationship, for the relationship of medical authority to to the lay to lay people, is 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 different than when you know somebody's abjectly ill with cancer and is desperate for a cure. We're basically um, pushing. We're recommending people come in for tests. They're otherwise healthy. They're in a good state of mind potentially around it, and there should be a pretty high bar on ethical grounds as well. I think for before we disturb people's um, peace of mind, that we know what we're doing. And we're not just creating, um, you know, unlike like, you know, a medicine that might respond in my body a little different from your body, you know, zinc for a cold or something. I could have some I could have some individual sense that even though on in general uh, this medicine there's no good evidence for it, I think it works for my body. There's a certain plausibility for that, you know. It, however unscientific you might think that. But when it comes to risk reduction, there is no like. You know, we're talking about nothing that has symptoms. We're talking about just probabilities. And it's just this case where I think we're, we want a really high bar, high bar of scientific evidence. Um, and, you know, I guess uh, just as a personal anecdote, um, my wife and I are both physicians. We had our son in born in 1992. And uh, we had decided that um, screening for Down's syndrome was something we didn't want to do because uh, we made the decision was unlikely, and if it happened, we would go through with a with a pregnancy. And we made the calculation based on looking at the data. My my wife had been in OB joint for a few years that the dangers of you know there were minimal benefits of just routine ultras, ultrasonography in pregnancy. They could find what we doctors call incidental omas, you know, things that have no import or you can't do anything about as much as they would find anything that could be done during pregnancy. Plus they're false so we positives, resolved, which are important to yeah, people always forget positive, about yeah. that. Yeah. 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 And anyway, we made this decision. We're just going to go without routine ultrasounds. And I can't tell you how many times during my wife's pregnancy, we had to like fight off the wand, you know, that was coming there. We need to check your dates. You know, you know, they, they understood it almost kind of a service, like, you know, teeth whitening at the end of a dental visit or something that made people go home with a picture and feel good about themselves or, you know, information about gender or something. And, you know, I'm not defending this. This, I mean, this is an idiosyncratic decision my wife and I made, but I think there's something real to deciding that you don't want to medicalize um, some part of your life. And if there isn't good data pro, pro that medicalization, uh, you know, I think it's, it, it's important to find to allow people some ways to do it. We, I don't think it could have been done. If my, I don't think we could have avoided those ultrasounds if my wife and I hadn't been physicians, and you know had the authority to sort of push people away. Well, we did. We did. It's not funny. Our, our first child was born in 1992. Also, we also made yeah. that same decision. Uh, we did push them away. It wasn't easy, and uh, yeah. part of it's because people looked at us like we were crazy. It's like again, yeah. like oh, you're, what are it's you some kind of you're kind of, kind of yeah. medieval. Anti techno, a luddite. You're primitive. Don't you want to know? And my answer was, no, I don't want to know. And they couldn't. It was puzzling to them, partly because it was just rare. Um, let's, you let's, know, and you know, you and I talked before this. I mean, there there are certain screening programs that I think uh, there's pretty good data for. Um, in some situations, colonoscopy. I've I've had two. So the disturbance to peace of mind thing, I want to elaborate a little bit because I, I don't think it's just a matter of, you know, the situation you and your wife and my wife were in with, um, you know, with a normal part of life, having a child and, and wanting it to be as, you know, free of medical problems as possible. It's also a very, very powerful, this issue is also a very, very powerful driver of our overdiagnosis and overtreatment of some diseases. And let me illustrate this with the problem of prostate cancer. And I'll, and I'll do it in the form of a kind of prototypical situation, which is a man goes into his internist or family doctor's office and often without any uh, actual discussion of cost and benefits, a PSA test is added to quote unquote routine blood work. And the uh, patient gets a call from the nurse that the actual PSA level was high. He immediately thinks he might have cancer. He comes back for uh, a visit, gets referred to a urologist. 
urologist discusses the pros and cons of the whole thing, may ask for another test, but often it ends up uh, going to biopsy. And biopsy today involves often an ultrasounded guided um, survey of the whole prostate gland, with sometimes up to 20 or 25 biopsy uh, needle uh, specimens are taken. And it's not atypical, especially as men get older, for one of those or more of those 25 biopsies to have a low-grade cancer. Cancer is graded by pathologists with something called the Gleason score, and there's these low-grade numbers that come up. I mean, I know this happens a lot. I'm often called by friends asking what to do. And the, the urologists have come around to the fact that there's not very good data uh, supporting a radical prostatectomy uh, or pushing people to definitely have radical prostatectomy or radiation under the situation. That is, many people seem to limp along just fine, even though there's something called cancer in their body as, to, as, as picked up by a screening test. So the alternative to going for surgery, I know I'm being a little bit long-winded here, but I want to get to this point, is not just walking away from the urologist, but you're now committed to sort of, in most cases, a lifetime of every six months getting your PSA tested again. Often there's, you know, there's a lot of um, innovation in the surveillance routines where people get repeated biopsies, or repeated ultrasounds, or they look at the um, free PSA or the RAP, or there's a complicated normograms tracking the changing rates of PSA levels. And often this triggers some threshold which leads to surgery, but the thing that I have noticed is that this creates a kind of state of risk and a state of anxiety, a feeling like the sword of Damocles is over your head. And many people, many men, decide to get a prostatectomy, not to rid themselves, you know, of, you know, cure, live a longer life, but to rid themselves of the state of uncertainty that they found themselves in. It's a, you know, I guess I'm trying to say it's not a trivial, small thing, not that, you know, our decision about not having ultrasounds is a small one, but it becomes very consequential when the medical routines themselves create a kind of experienced state of bodily, state of bodily risk that involves routine, unpleasant routines, you know, um, fateful visits with doctors and tests. And a very reasonable response to a lot of people is like, let's be done with it, get the thing out. And, and not just that, but the, the family members are even more eager often than the person with the um, with the problem because they're they're afraid too, and right. they're, the sort of Damocles is hanging over their head as well. And and the way you described it is exactly the way uh, I've heard it described by many many people in my in my family and friends when they have these issues. Come, we just get it out of there. And um, yeah. unfortunately, getting out of there is side effect has cons consequences. It's it's not oh, an easy surgery. Yeah. Uh, but but more than that, a lot of times there's just – there's no point to it. You've got a slow-growing cancer, it, it, but it has that C in it, and it's scary because right. it's cancer. Uh, you yeah. actually mentioned at the end of your book, I found it fascinating. You said that, you know, like the ultrasound, you've gone to your doctor to make sure when you get your physical to make sure you don't get the PSA. Yeah. And the la my last physical was a few months ago, my most recent physical, and my PSA came back low, fortunately – but I asked my doctor, who's a smart I, – I respect him a lot. He's a very good doctor. I said, why would you do the PSA? He said, I don't know. You know, it's because it's kind of like – and it's just it, – there's a box, and it's what gets checked, and it's been checked. Yeah. And I'm going to be more aggressive next time not to check it, to make sure it doesn't get tested. I don't want to know that number because it's not a meaningful number. Uh, so I'm not putting my head in the sand. I'm not, uh, I'm not being unscientific. I, there's a lot of evidence that it's a good thing not to know that number, it seems. Uh, listeners will right. make their own choices, consult with their own physicians. We don't give medical advice here, but I personally yeah. will not be getting a PSA test anytime soon as a routine matter. Yeah, and I think, you know, with a couple of caveats that you and I should pay attention to new scientific developments. Of course. And, um, you know, and, and understand that the situation is very different when a PSA test is used as part of a diagnostic routine because your doctor, for example, has felt an, uh, a nodule on a rectal exam. You know, there's a lot of subtleties to, um, you know, any, any test in a way. Totally sometimes get lost, yeah. You know, and, 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 you know, but with a good doctor, you know, you're not expected to go to medical school as a patient, but you, you know, you, you should have a doctor that can um, explain these subtleties to you. Um, you know, you're an, you're an economist, and one of the things that I find interesting in understanding these sort of psychological dimensions of our fear is to think about the you know behavioral economics literature and how it might apply 
to um, things I've looked at historically. And um, one of the really interesting things is that this is not from um, Risky Medicine, but from my breast cancer book. I, I started the book with a case of breast, a woman who had developed breast cancer, or we think it, what they called, it probably was breast cancer in, in 1812. Uh, here in Philadelphia. And it turns out her brother-in-law was the leading surgeon in America at the time, um, uh, whose name was Physic. And um, Physic didn't, you know, th- you know then in, there's a lot of cynicism about cancer surgery in 1812. I mean, it was a brutal operation done without anesthesia, but uh, not so much the dangers. People also didn't believe that you could actually cure cancer by surgery alone. So it was rarely done, but this was his sister-in-law, it was seemingly small, um, and they went into days of consultation about it. And she left a whole slew of letters that allowed me to sort of get an inkling into their decision making. But the thing that tipped her, I mean, when she explained to her father, who was living in England, um, months later, why she did this incredibly painful half hour up, you know, amputation of her breast without anesthesia on our kitchen table in Burlington, New Jersey, she said, uh, in the end, she would rather go to her death. I mean, she talked in Philadelphia Quakerese, and I said, I'm not going to get this right, and I don't have the book in front of me, but she said she'd rather go to her death knowing that all, uh, st- there was no stone unturned. Um, she said she had done everything, so she'd have no regret before she died. And, you know, the the Kahnemans of the world, you know, very powerful, heuristic and decision-making, they talk about as anticipated regret. And, you know, this was, this was and is active, you know, I'm reminded of this when you see the family members are also are often the worst or often the most important um, interest group in these decisions yeah. to go for surgery. You know, because I think, you know, you know, at least, you know, in the Jewish world I grew up in, whatever, the guilt is kind of a familial issue, not just an individual issue. And, and anticipating this kind of guilt or regret from not doing everything possible now and, and something and, bad. Right. And it, if, it, it's a very powerful force. And, it's, and it was there long before people knew what behavioral economics was. Yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot lately about the, the, the science of regret. We, we really yeah. would like to prevent it. We'd like to prevent regret, and yet there is no way to prevent it because there's type 1 and type 2 errors. There's, there's false positives and false negatives, and there's times we, make, we, we, act, we act and th- bad things happen. We act and good things happen. We don't act and good things happen. We don't act and bad yep. things happen. And it's very yeah. hard. We don't feel the same about active and passive actions. Very hard to, to, to accept that. And, uh, and the, errors the, of omission and yeah, commission. Yeah. It's very so difficult. It's very, it's very tricky and it's very hard to be normative here. And you know, one of the startling things, not from my own historical work, but in colleagues of, my, of mine who – study the overdiagnosis and overtreatment problem using health service research econometric techniques and surveys, whatever, is that uh, one of the surprising findings is that people who've, got, uh, who've, who've experienced a false positive diagnosis of cancer and lived for weeks or months with the feeling that they had cancer, but were later found out by some confirmatory test or maybe even at the time of operation that there was no cancer in the body. These people do not generally end up being like you know, the iatrogenically wounded who are the advocates for doing less. Many of the people who find themselves in a situation are actually more pro-screening and more pro-intervention than people who weren't, in my mind, harmed this way. And you have to imagine, I mean, this is empirical survey data, you have to imagine that there's some psychological condition where people feel like they've had a life-enhancing experience by having dodged a bullet. You know, they yeah. got some exposure to death and they didn't, and did, you know, and they they had some mastery over it, even if it was just in some sense a false thing that was then removed, and it has a kind of positive meaning to people. And you know, these are very these aren't like trivial things. These are things that sort of at the core of a lot of our conundrums about how to actually uh, decide what are you know where to where to look for risk and whether to do it or or not, and what to do about it. Yeah, I don't mean to trivialize it, but it it's a little like yeah. um, a roller coaster ride, right? You go on the ride. Yeah. You have it. Ex- you have you have great fun because at the end you survived it, and it's you had yeah. that thrill, that that horror and thrill of fear. But it's over. So, were you glad you went on the roller coaster? Oh yeah, it was great. So there is a similar emotional roller coaster there for the that that false positive uh, or false negative in this case, I guess. Um, no, it's false positive. But 
let's let's go. No, that's great, by the way. I've never gone on a roller coaster. Yeah, you're afraid so to, right? Yeah. Ex- yeah, I don't yeah, like them either. Maybe, <laughs> maybe this explains my uh, sensitivity to this issue in some way. So yeah, yeah exactly. I grew up within a mi- I grew up like uh, you know about a mile away from the roller coasters of Coney Island. So. Do you like Do you like horror movies? No, I don't either. See, we got that in common yeah. too. Yeah, um, so maybe it's the, the you know the kind of raw carrot test we should uh, <laughs> give people to help guide them through risk make risk decisions. So I want to I want to back up a little bit and I want to talk about this whole general concept of of riskiness and it comes mm-hmm. through in the book in a number of places. Obviously, it runs through the whole book in many ways, but I want to get at it through the chapter where you talk about the Framingham Heart Study, and yeah. I, I I argue and. Um, I take some flack for it from my from my listeners and readers that epidemiology is um, actually I, I've described it as an intellectual cesspool, uh, which probably is not the most flattering way to describe it. Uh, but there is a terrible problem in epidemiology as well as in economics that we're talking about complex systems where we can't control for everything. We're trying to isolate the impact of one variable or two variables. Right. And I'd like your thoughts on that. You can put frame it in the in pardon the pun, the, in the Framingham Heart Study is where sort of this right. this this phenomenon was born of, 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 of risk analysis for the general population. Yeah. So, um, you know, that, that chapter is, you know, is not meant to, you know, damn the Framingham investigators. You know, in fact, I had the great pleasure of, um, you know, almost all the leading investigators the study started in 1949. Uh, are long dead, but I I did some research on this um, on this study while uh, some of the principal investigators were alive. Who were all, uh, you know, the, the, they they weren't card carrying epidemiologists. They were clinicians in practice uh, who, uh, for one reason or another, ended up in public health service, marine hospital system, and had this practical problem of a newly discovered, you know, heart disease epidemic. You know, that caused Eisenhower to have a heart attack while in office and. Seemingly was the white man's burden, middle, the stressed out middle class executives were falling left and right around them. And, and there was very little knowledge, you know, about the causes of it. And they ended up um, not in a very preplanned way, uh, tacking this way and that uh, and ending up with a very, you know, um, interesting longitudinal study of people who didn't initially have heart disease. And following them for a very long time, in fact, the study continues in their children and grandchildren today to see who developed heart disease. But what, what these were clinicians, and they what they were looking for, I mean, their audience essentially were was a physician in private practice and what kinds of factors they could find in the course of a neural physical exam and laboratory analysis that could help them predict, you know, who might drop dead of a heart attack or not. And on those terms, I think the study is actually, you know, was remarkably successful. And, uh, and obviously very consequential in the way we think about heart disease. But um, they understood, the investigators, and it's clear if you think about this for a while, that the causality was all based on, on these individual factors, on like what, you know, how many cigarettes an individual smokes um, and what their blood pressure was. But there, um, there could be no way in, in this kind of study of individuals you know, that was comparing to another community to understand the things things that happened above the individual or super individually. And, you know, in some sense, one of the contribu- contributions to the mid-century heart epidemic was the sale of tobacco. And how did tobacco get? How did the cigarette get into everybody's body? You know, this has a, this is a complex story of marketing of. Uh, is a profit to be made in tobacco, the role of the southern states, Democrats, and political economy, you know, you know, a, a very complex story of factors, you know, but, but the Framingham study could itself only study these individual factors and, and also with the resolution that is the knowledge they had at the time. So, you know, what to me the Framingham story is, it's a, it's a kind of story of something that gets in, um, the risk factor gets, you know, in fact, the first time uh, in a non-actuarial setting, the term risk factor is used is in the 1962 Framingham study. You have a birth of a certain kind of mindset uh, that has probably contributed to some health benefits, uh, for sure, uh, but it's very narrow and it's very individual. Um, and in some sense, the roads not traveled have been uh, ignored. You know, they were ignored before the Framingham study, but it's a we've been so um, we're farther away so from the fork in the road. Yeah, <clears throat> further further away from it. Yeah, yeah. and. Um, you know, and the other aspect of it is that these risk factors became I mean, prior to the Framingham study. You know, doctors, 
you know, gave like homely advice to their patients or something, but they, they didn't see themselves as like, you know, diagnosing specific preventable factors and giving people medicines for them. That was, that was kind of hocus pocus and something, you know, pre- prevention was the job of public health authorities or something, not theirs. But we saw this rapid change, you know, where so much of your visits, your primary care doctor is really about risk interventions, you know, and this kind of epidemiological knowledge base became, um, you know, the platform on which everything is built. And of course, today, you know, there's a, you're not the, I wouldn't call it an, you know, a intellectual cesspool or anything, but many epidemiologists themselves, especially around small relative risks, where, you know, there's a burgeoning industry of people who find that, you know, that some tiny factor in lifestyle or diet or uh, behavior increases, you know, your chances in some statistically significant value, but, but whose impact, you have no idea what it means. Uh, you know, and then the next day somebody else produces another study, another observational study that goes the other way, you know. Correct. So there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of crisis within like chronic disease epidemiology, very, you know, so much so that, you know, some people call for, you know, unless it's, you know, something has like a risk factor of seven, a, re- a relative risk of seven or something, let's not even bother publishing it because it's just, you know, we're just waiting for, you know, somebody else tomorrow to revert it. Yeah, but you get on the, you get on the front page of the New York Times, very hard to, often to resist that temptation. If you have the positive finding, yeah. not often if you have the negative finding. Correct. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, so the framing, it's, a, it's an interesting historical moment. Um, and, and, you know, that, uh, you know, I, I did want to include in the, in the, in the book. Yeah. By the way, you, you speak about it very neutrally in the book. I, I was waiting for a little bit more venom, but it was, it, you, it's yeah. a more of a historical descriptive episode. But I think yeah. it's, it's the, uh, its effect on the zeitgeist is what comes through. This sort of yes. general idea that we should be reducing our risk through exercise, diet, uh, lifestyle, et cetera. And I, you know that that has become you know a pervasive aspect of our lives. And so, right, let me ask you a few questions about that. Sh- should I get a before? Fist- before I don't want to forget this. But, yeah. You know, I teach undergraduates here at Penn, and I often ask people, like you know, kids, you know, whether they're healthy or what health is. And the response I often get is, I'm healthy. Look, I, uh, you know, don't eat carbs and, you know, avoid <laughs> gluten and, uh, you know, uh, go to the gym and whatever. It, it, it's not like these are, you know, this is the point I try to make in the book. It's maybe too subtle for, for my own good, but it's, these are not, as I think of them, means to health. This is, in fact, what people think is health is at yeah. the end. And, and we and do. That's a, it, it, that's a very, you know, a Martian coming to, you know, the U.S. in 2015 might find this odd. Yeah, no, it's a great point. So wh- what should my attitude be um, if I want to uh, uh, prosper and live long? Is it good to go to the gym? Is it foolish to be worried about these things? Well, you know, I, should I, I don't get a physical, should I get a book, physical every but, year? I mean, you, know, this, this, you know, the major things are don't smoke. You know, and avoid a big one. Uh, extreme ob- extreme obesity, and and don't get hit by a truck. You know, yeah. um, the uh, uh, those are the major things you you know you need to do. There's, like I said, a few a few screening tests in life, vaccination for children. Uh, the, the the required vaccinations are, are good things to have. I mean, uh, in, in terms of secondary prevention, there are some things like beta blockers after heart attacks, which have shown good evidence for. But you know, the majority of like lifestyle claims that people make. Um, you know, are not terribly well substantiated. And, you know, if you look at from a historical arc, now people are complaining that the um, obesity epidemic is a, res- is a response to the earlier uh, dietary consensus that fat should be avoided, you know, and, you know, it's, it's, it, it's easy to be cynical here. Yeah, you know? It's hard to um, know. But, so, it's, but it's hard to know. So as we go forward, we're at this, I think, apparent cusp of incredible explosion of knowledge about our own bodies through, yes. I don't know, the, the confluence of the smartphone, the digital revolution, the da- big data, um, the genetic uh, mapping and the cost coming down. It, we are standing on the, it seems, on the edge of a huge increase in knowledge about how our bodies work. Do you think we're going to make some progress in those areas where we could actually make some reliable Claims about lifestyle, diet, et cetera, because my view is we know remarkably little right now. Yeah, I share you that we know remarkably little right now. Uh, the book has a kind of cautionary tale aspect to the new personalized medicine and genetic, 
you know, knowledge of, you know, genetic risk, you know, that's like, that has already been flowing, but it's likely to become much more prevalent as the course of whole body screening happens. And, you know, the, um, nightmare vision I have is that, you know, when you get back, uh, 23 and me, uh, results that say you have a three times risk of diabetes and a two times risk of heart disease and a, you know, 50% lower than average chance of dying of testicular cancer or something that this will create a market for all kinds of, you know, especially when the risks are higher than normal for promised interventions that are based either on the genetic manipulation or some, you know, temporary pathophysiological understanding that's going to be uprooted, you know, a week from now. It's just very hard to risk one, once one believes one's at risk of something. And one of the one of the really tough implications, I think, and I, maybe we can talk about this a little bit, of the dangers of the knowledge without um, good evidence of the interventions being effective is whether we should have some threshold for not communicating this knowledge to people until we know we can do something with it. And that does sound very Luddite-like, and you know, and I, and I don't claim to have a crystal ball to know what insights about risk will be fruitful and what not. So I would not really want to be the you know knowledge czar turning on the spigots of who gets research funding and not. But at the clinical end, you know, the end of what information gets communicated to patients, I think you know we're just potentially facing such an avalanche of. Uh, potentially actionable information for which there isn't evidence about those actions that we might need some kind of, um, you know, rolsy and bargain with ourselves to keep our heads collectively in the sand until we have good knowledge about particular interventions efficacy. And um, I, I don't know how that would work practically, so don't press me on it at yeah. some level, but I do worry about, um, you know, the profit to be made, the, you know, fear and uncertainty that will, will be, that will be unleashed by having this kind of information communicated to people without any good sense of what to do about it. Well, um, I think you're you know, let alone, you know, there's, there's epistemological problems with the, with the data about risk itself, which often gets, you know, yeah. you know, you, you know, that often changes with um, new resolution technologies and, you know, unselected populations and things like that. But even if the knowledge was solid about the probabilities without an intervention to do something about it, I'm not sure we really are doing people and ourselves a favor by communicating it. Well, I think your book and maybe this uh, conversation is going to help people think about how to think about this and what they want to know and what they don't want to know. And I, I, I just was, it's a particularly appropriate week to be having the conversation. There's been a recent change. I think it was this week or last week over the frequency of, of mammograms that are recommended. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a woman, but I love my wife, so I'm very yes. aware of the risks and and uh, the questions of whether mam regular mammograms are a good idea. But having said that, I never looked at the numbers, and because this week uh, happened with these changes and recommendations, because I was reading your book uh, and yeah. getting ready for the interview, I happened to look at some of the the data that people were uh, putting up about mammography. In fact. I, I tweeted a Mother Jones article. It doesn't happen that often that I get to tweet an article from Mother Jones, but there was an article about the numbers. <laughs> and then I found another uh, piece, uh, I forget where it was from on it. And I was, uh, I think it was a, a JAMA article. I, I was stunned. I think in the JAMA article, I think it said out of 10,000 mammograms, there were sick, over 6,000 false positives and that 10 deaths are averted from those. I mean, it's it's a... It's a stunningly imprecise, yeah. tragically yeah. imprecise thing, and and um, I, it just uh, I, I was just shocked when you look at again. I, my point here is you, you have to look at the numbers, and one of the themes of your book is that the culture, what's in the air, the sort of what's expected, whether it's the ultrasound for the pregnant during the pregnancy or the PSA test, it's just everyone just sort of says, well, of course you're going to get a mammogram. I mean, well. You know, the, you know, I don't have the numbers at my fingertips, and the um, numbers needed to treat statistic that you quoted gets better for women as they go through menopause and older. Uh, you know, but you're right since we're going from I don't know how many thousand woman years of screening, you know, to lesser amounts of thousands of years of woman screening to to save to avert one death. 
from breast cancer at the cost of many false positives, which often lead to overtreatment, which themselves carry death risks. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, not, so, it's not so, I'm so not the, saying, a, I'm not a saying a very, it's not worth saving thing. the lives. That's not yeah, the point. Yeah. It's the point. The, yeah. All the other costs that come with it, which are just sort right. of like pushed to the side. Yeah. And, um, you know, many, many people have made, you know, these observations. And one of the things I wrote the book for was to say, I don't think another study or another piece of data is going to, you know, change the game very much. Um, and I think we have to think about what work does screening mammography do for the different interested actors. And by exploring that work and, and the historical and structural conditions that make that work possible, maybe there's another way out of the situation. And and then, you know, the cynical part of me says, really, the issue is not screening mammography, it's the screening genetic test. So things that you haven't yet haven't put in, have, have not yet been put in the water. Because I think, you know, once something reaches a kind of equilibrium in people's roots, you know, it's part of being an American woman today, you go for their annual mammogram, it's like a part of life in a way. Uh, you know, once a norm like that gets established and does the social and psychological work of reducing fear and controlling uncertainty, it's very, very hard to dislodge. And so, you know, my real hope in some ways is to prevent prevention in a way, to prevent more things being done outside of experimental trials. Um, but, you know, it's very tricky, you know, like maybe we should talk, you know, as two men talk about prostate cancer because it's a very analogous situation in yeah. a way. The, um, you know, in 19, 2009, um, some 20 years after, after PSA testing, you know, diffused widely in, in American medicine and society and the rest of the world as well. It was only in 2009 that were the first results of a randomized clinical trial of screening. Yeah, I was shocked to, to read that. I just shocked. Know? So, I mean, the real fact is not like what those studies show. It's that, you know, this thing became a mass phenomenon with its own inertia and social and psychological efficacy long before there was any scientific evidence. It's almost, it's almost a bit player in the story. But... But let's forget about that for a second and look at the data itself. And um, one study at the time showed actually no benefit for, you know, immortality benefit for screening, which in, you know, in some ways, if you leave those data, if you think the follow-up is long enough and later follow-up complicated this result, um, you know, you should just not do it. The other study was a multi-center European study where if you did some subgroup analysis, including some countries and not others, there did seem to be a ben mortality benefit for averting prostate cancer deaths, but at a very high cost. And the, the rule of thumb number needed to treat statistic that was quoted by the editorialist and the authors themselves of the study was that some 50 men would need to be treated. Forget about screen, you know, thousands of men would need to be screened to get those 50 men who were gonna end up being treated. But anyway, 50 men needed to be treated for prostate cancer that was picked up by screening in order to avert a single death. And, you know, those numbers have since changed and they've moved, but, you know, it's very hard psychologically for an individual sitting in the decision, make, you know, the decision making seat to sort of put their, wrap their hands around what that might mean. You know, I'm in, I'm in, in medicine. I've seen lots of people uh, end up with uh, incontinence and impotence after surgery or develop a, a blood clot in their leg while they're hospitalized incidentally and die in a way. You know, my own common sense, um, you know, it doesn't add up that I would risk, you know, 50 to 1 odds of getting this, you know, actually go, you know, I have to have, you know, have, you know, 50 men would have to have the surgery in order to save a life. It, that's a thing that doesn't make much sense. I, I guess it's plausible that it might make sense for someone else, you know, uh, though I don't really think so if they really understood what these, what the risks were involved uh, in some ways. Uh, and which leads me to another thing, which is I think when we get to these really typical, really difficult dilemmas, the mantra of many of my well-minded clinician colleagues and ethicists is to say, well, let the patient decide and the doctor decide in some kind of idealized model of shared decision-making. And I, um, it's not like I have a great s solution myself, but I'm fairly cynical about um, that being the last resort will be say when we don't have good, good enough evidence to actually resolve a policy or a clinical problem to say, let, let's, let's just, you know, send the information out and let the doctor and patient decide. Uh, I just think cognitively it's too complex and maybe just like I was saying about knowledge, shutting off or at least modulating the knowledge production bigot in some ways, maybe there are situations where the data is so confusing and we really don't have a clear idea to use some kind of principle of first do no harm and not bring it up in the first place at all uh, and not make it an element of like take the test and then 
have a shared decision making around it. And part of this, I have to tell you, is informed by my uh, fairly negative experience as a practicing primary care physician in the 1990s when all the major, uh, maybe I'm exaggerating, but many major expert advisory panels from different um, uh, physician groups suggested either that women should get hormone replacement therapy when they're uh, menopausal, or at least you should initiate a discussion of the risks and benefits of giving this therapy. And at the time, my analysis of the many observational trials that seem to show some efficacy to this thing were all flawed in the same direction of a kind of healthy woman effect. There had not been a randomized control trial. There was so much profit to be made and crass manipulation of the market by the hormone replacement manufacturers. And just the very term hormone replacement therapy was basically, you know, one of these terms that, you know, creates its own demand by, you know, if you ever, you know, if you're, you're missing guessing, something, you're missing you know, something, you know, you know, like, you know, you could call it, you know, just the names of the drugs or something else in any way. So anyway, I had this uh, cynicism and reluctance and I did not initiate discussions with my female patients as they brought it up. I talked to them about it because I didn't think there was a good reason to do it. Um, and that was part of what I th considered my medical responsibility. Uh, there's thousands of other things that are not being pushed by special interests I could have brought up that are thrown out into the ether that are not being discussed. Why this? And it's one of the few cases in, in, in my clinical life and, you know, observer of medical developments where there, there was this, you know, unbelievable, like, right answer that came out in the form of a clinical trial called the Women's Health Initiative that showed that these hormone replacement therapies, which were, by the way, given to prevent osteoporosis and heart disease. They weren't given for the menopausal symptoms. When they're given as preventatives, do more harm than good. It was incontrovertible. It reminds me of that Woody Allen movie where two people are arguing about the meaning of Marshall McLuhan on a, on a, on a line oh, trying yeah. to get into the big <laughs> theater, and Marshall McLuhan comes up and says, you're right, and you're wrong. You know? like, it's just rare that there's stuff like yeah. that in some ways. So I think um, what he, I think Woody Allen says turns to the camera at that point and says, "Why can't life be more like this?" So yeah, you're, you're yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that women's health initiative results was like a little little moment like that, you yeah. know, around it. And having lived through that, in some ways, you know, and having some you know historical research under my belt too, um, the way we deal with uncertainty in the present, you know, can often be very either laughable or um, you know look back with some you know, to fire children or this Martian I invoke here and there, you know, with some degree of, you know, you know, alarm and, 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 you know, how do people, why do people do that? Um, when, you, when you mention the idea that people will talk it over with their doctor and come to a decision, it, to be honest, what we're really doing there is almost, when there's no evidence, it's almost like saying flip a coin. We would never, it would be very hard for most people to say, well, should I get the surgery or not? Well, I'll flip a coin. Uh, that's an even if it's not a fair coin, it's an unattractive uh, way to make a decision. My only thought about that mutual decision or whatever you want to call it is that there's some as aspect of talk therapy, at least at least having discussed it. Maybe a person would feel better than actually just flipping a coin. Um, I'm interested in what kind of response you've gotten from your fellow uh, physicians from these kinds of arguments that you make. Uh, did they see you as dangerous? And I, I just want to say, by the way, before I just want to get this in because it's really important. Those people listening and it's a it's a very interesting book, Risky Medicine. I encourage you to, to read it. And more than anything else, when you hear this conversation, I, what I want I'd like listeners to take away from it is educate yourself. Look at the numbers yourself. And if you can't look at them yourself, uh, get somebody who's, if you're not skilled enough or, or you don't know enough to look at them, get somebody who's thoughtful to look at them. A friend of mine asked me, uh, she's facing a, a hysterectomy and she wants to know whether she should get her ovaries removed at the same time. And she sent me a study she found because she wanted to educate herself. And it yeah. said that uh, a recent study that found that um, removing the ovaries was dangerous because it led to an increase in the risk of heart disease. And um, I looked at the de at the study and it didn't look like a very good study to me because it had this problem that you're talking about that I don't, yeah. know, I don't know enough about the, the, the nature of the, of the women who made those decisions and whether they're like the women who didn't. It's not a clinical, clinical trial. And so I said, that's not a good study, that one. And, and she said, but it's a bit, there are a lot of, it had a big population. I said, that's not enough. So yeah. educate yourself, think about it, talk to people who are, who are, who have thought about data and try to get, uh, try to help, a decision with evidence rather than just 
what everyone tells you because it's uh, it's complicated. So, so your question was, how do my physician colleagues? Yeah, like, sorry, respond? yeah, back to that. Now they get uh, off my, you know, my you know, soapbox. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's it's okay. You know, I haven't lost any physician friends, and maybe you know, like attracts like, and you know, I I I, I, I teach at the University of Pennsylvania, and I. You know, I live in a world of high-powered health service researchers where um, there's a lot of fealty played to evidence, um, and uh, most people realize that I'm essentially providing a backstory uh, having to do with the social, economic, and structural context for things that are puzzling and, uh, you know, t troubling in the epidemiological trends that, you know, that are often just looked in terms of, of data itself. So I, I don't um, – and I would say – Moreover, when I, I have given like grand rounds to you know audiences of people who largely comply with most most some screening recommendations that I'm not in favor of, or whatever, um, I get an occasional um, person who you know tells an anecdotal story about how someone you know went for a screening test and got you know and was found out to have very invasive cancer and they were taken out and they're alive and if they hadn't had the screening test they would be dead. So there, what do you say now? Um, and uh, you know, but that's very rare. You know, I mean, especially younger physicians. You know, whatever are, are they, it's not that they're, they're they're trained sophisticated in a sophisticated way to think about scientific evidence. I went through medical school at Yale. I wasn't trained that way, uh, really. But I think their lived experience of you know, like on the street, doctors talk about incidental omas, and they have some intuitive knowledge of how one thing, one damn thing, leads to another, and some reluctance to go a certain way. Uh, because of that, and I think, unlike some of you know my Foucaultian oriented sociology friends, whatever go on a kind of direct frontal attack on the false consciousness of medicine and people in authority, I try to tap into the lived experience of you know patients, friends, but also uh, doctors, and try to give a kind of um, scaffold to hang this kind of uncertainty and discomfort. Like your doctor who said to you, well, I don't know why I do the PSA test, I'm just kind of doing it. That's not an easy thing to live with, you know, when you're on the medical end of it. You, you kind of, you're hoping you're actually doing some good for people, you know, yes. and not not complicating it. So I think if you, you don't, um, this is more of a message I give to, you know, people outside of medicine that want to reach medical audiences without turning them off in a way is to realize that, you know, these, the, the, these contradictions are lived out every, you know, every day in, in the offices of, of people in practice. And they are subject to all kinds of undue influences that they're trying to sort of steer some path between, you know, different shoals that are about to, you know, crash, the ship's about to crash into. And, you you know, so I, I've, I, you know, in my good days, I feel like I, provide some social and historical context for this thing. And, it, and it, I hope the book is, doesn't appear shrill, you know, on, because there are things, you know, so much things we just don't know. And, um, uh, and, you know, I'm not by any means against, in fact, I'm very pro, you know, the, the, or even the biotechnological emphasis in medicine today, uh, you know, as long as we're subjecting what we find to, to, uh, clinical trials and, and good evidence. Um, you know, I have a good friend being kept alive right now by some uh, targeted therapy that was just developed in like in a phase one trial. And, um, you know, I'm thankful I'm living in, you know, this, it's unlikely to have a big population effect, but for the individuals affected, this is really, uh, you know, there's some wonderful uh, things that come out of, you know, the U.S.'s and Western world's commitment to biomedical research. It's just that, you know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, like this. There's, there's a lot of problematic things. And the pharmaceutical companies, I mean, I, one of the reasons I got interested in that, that one of those prongs I started the interview with about the, the, the profit motive to treat risk rather than symptoms or disease is that I literally had uh, a CEO of a very, very, very big, maybe one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies who just like left his job like the week before, talked to some of my students. And, you know, he told this very cynical story. He said the street, you know, he meant Wall Street, um, requires like a 10% return on, you know, increase in, in sales every year. He said, you know, we haven't had a new effective drug in, in 10 years. Uh, you know, where's this going to come from? And he said, you know, ultimately, even this big pharmaceutical company didn't even have the kind of startup culture to develop new things. They had to, like, basically buy the patents of other people's drugs. But what they were really good at was detailing physicians yeah. and getting people to um, use medicines. 
And so the uh, big focus of a lot of their R&D, and the R&D was you know, impossible to separate from marketing, frankly, uh, was to develop drugs against risk. Uh, and common symptoms like Viagra, you know, things, you know, complaints that everyone has, but drugs that will be for everybody and for life. Yeah. So, you know, given that, um, that's why I'd like to see a world of medicine with less third party payments and more out of pocket. We seem to be moving in the other direction, but that's, um, that's another topic. Let's close, yeah. let's close with, um, with your thoughts on medical education. As you said, you were trained mm -hmm. at a, an acceptably good medical school, and yet you weren't exposed to a lot of these kind of ideas. Um, I find it remarkable how few doctors understand statistical issues. Uh, and taking a statistics class or a biostatistics class is not sufficient. What you learn in those classes typically is uh, the definitions of the different techniques and how the tests are run. And but we aren't. We don't give our we don't give many people, let alone doctors, uh, much much of it a training in this, in what we would call risk analysis, the, the, the kind of thoughtful trade-offs that we're talking about. And when you mentioned, you know, you mentioned survivorship or your friend being alive, um, the whole issue that runs through your book is that there's a quality of life issue here that typically gets yeah. totally lost. So how, how do you train? Should we train physicians? Do you think it's a good idea more uh, effectively in these issues? Well, I'll give you two answers that maybe you, you feel skirting the question, but you know, one is this is an issue for, I mean, since so many of the things we're talking about are mass interventions that everybody has to sort of make a decision about uh, in a way, and the physicians are only just one piece of input to the, you know, they're, the, they're not even the gatekeeper for many of these things. Um, it's an issue of educating the public as much as, is, you know, uh, healthcare workers, you know, um, yeah. you know, physicians or otherwise. So, uh, but the second thing is that, you know, I just tell you how I vote with my feet which is um, one of the things I do uh, in my day job is um, I'm chair of a history and sociology and science department. We have this very large major, it's one of the largest majors at Penn called Health and Societies. And it's getting people, and none of these, you know, are, are maybe a third of the this very large undergraduate group are going to end up being physicians, but uh, many of the others are going to the healthcare industry and they're going to different aspects of public health. Well, who knows what they'll end up doing in, in the rest of life. They're starting this way at some level. And I think, you know, in an intellectually, like, uh, mind-opening part of people's lives, like undergraduate life should be, uh, if you can have a serious engagement with not just statistics, but the humanistic and other social sciences that, you know, talk about comparative health systems and, uh, you know, the development of the, the history of therapeutics or – um, history of public health, um, a social, you know, numbers, quantitative things, but also the sort of historical development of it. That we're kind of, I mean, uh, you know, use an odd image here, but we're kind of vaccinating these future doctors and healthcare workers and people in the health system to be the consumers of what, what's later going to happen during medical socialization with a jaundiced eye or at least a skeptical eye and a way of at least of some vocabulary with which to make sense of the experiences that happen to them. That's at least, like I said, where I put my own energies in. I mean, part of it has to do with how incredibly demanding, not just, you know, medical schools, but, you know, the real training, you know, some of the formation of people's like medical personas happens when they do the residency training in the U.S., you know, in the, in the years of internship and residency where, you know, it's often, you know, maybe things were a bit better now than the bad old days I trained in where there's, you know, people are, are pushed to the very extreme of their uh, physical capacities yeah. and overwhelmed by things. And it's just not a, it's not a time of great reflection, <laughs> um, uh, overall. So, um, like I said, I put my own effort into doing so many things rather than, you know, being another person saying the medical curriculum should include my little thing, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, I go to some cur medical curriculum meetings are like, you know, pretty boring, but, you know, it, I always feel like, you know, it's that cliche of rearranging the deck chairs in the Titanic, yeah. you know, it's just not, it's just not, um, it's too much work is being pushed on it, uh, in, in some way. So. Um, but, you know, having said that, I'm, you know, I, I, some of my colleagues teach little clinical epi um, subsections, and I'm sure some of the things that get taught, uh, you know, but one of the, you know, the most powerful thing about the post of the medical school training is the fact that you're dealing with real people and real conundrums, you know, so, um, you know, some way of pro helping people process those experiences, uh, you know, people who have been harmed by, you know, you know, medical overdiagnosis and overtreatment in a way and, and getting some 
language to make sense of it would probably be of help. But I, I don't have a great program of reform in my own at the moment. I guess today has been Robert Aronowitz. His book is Risky Medicine. Robert, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's fun talking to you. Now for a brief postscript of the Econ Talk conversation I had with Robert Aronowitz about his provocative book, Risky Medicine. In the middle of this week's conversation, I made a reference to the evidence on the efficacy of mammograms, and we were talking about testing generally, and I got a little fired up, and I think I pleaded people, check out the data, check out the evidence when you consider getting any sort of diagnostic test. Now, some of my reaction and my uh, passion there was to the philosophical issues that Robert Aronowitz raised in his book, Our Human Desire to Reduce Risk. But part of my reaction was due to some reading I'd done in advance of the interview, the Mother Jones article I mentioned, and a JAMA article that mentioned that 10 deaths were averted for every 10,000 women getting an annual mammogram from age 50 to 59. 10 deaths averted struck me as a small number compared to the other human costs of regular screening. 6,100 false positives over 900 biopsies that showed nothing but caused women to have anxiety in their family. In addition, there are non-trivial numbers of overdiagnosis that lead to unnecessary mastectomies. Then there's the risk from the radiation and so on. So the evidence in the chart in the JAMA article that I was looking at seemed pretty important to consider in a culture where until the recent changes and recommendations, an annual mammogram was treated as a no-brainer or at least regular mammograms. So looking at the evidence seems like a very good idea. And that's what generated my passionate statement about look at the evidence, look at the data. I don't remember exactly what I said, but something like that. And I had that chart in mind. So after I finished the conversation, the recording, I shared these thoughts with a friend of mine who's an OBGYN. And she was not nearly as impressed as I was with that JAMA chart and summary of the costs and benefits of uh, regular mammograms for women between the ages of 50 and 59. She pointed out, for example, that the measure of deaths averted probably was based on older studies when mammogram technology was less effective. She also wondered about how they measured overdiagnosis, survival rates with and without mammograms. And I started thinking, yeah, how did they measure that? And she wondered if the results distinguished between the average woman and women who maybe have a higher risk of breast cancer, such as women who have breast cancer in their family. So that reminded me to go back and look at the chart I'd been reading and to see what the source for the numbers uh, were. I had stupidly treated it as something of a census, an exercise in counting rather than a set of estimates. So I went and found the supporting article. It was another JAMA article. That's from the Journal of the American Medical Association. And discussing mortality, the authors say they got those numbers from eight large randomized, these are the death averted of 10. They got those, that measure from eight large randomized control trials between 1960 and 1990. And then they mentioned the following, quote, some argued that the RCTs, that's the randomized control trials, some argued that the RCT, RCTs are unlikely to be applicable, applicable to women undergoing screening today because they preceded treatment advances that have powerfully influenced breast cancer mortality and used older mammography techniques. However, the RCTs nevertheless provide the best data available, close quote. Well, that drew me up short. Uh, my friend was right. Maybe those estimates of 10 deaths averted were understating what the effects are today. And by the way, I'll put links, of course, up to the chart and the, this article I mentioned is the source for the chart in the links to this episode. So... That's the deaths averted issue. What about the other costs, uh, the human health costs of, of regular screening? Well, of course, there were esti those estimates had issues as well. Uh, now, some of them might be reliable, but it's hard to know. I, I should have gone back and looked at the sources that they used to generate those estimates, and I, I hadn't done that. So maybe I was overly negative having looked at that chart. But I mention all this for two reasons. The evidence is almost never straightforward. It's almost always complicated. Second point is that it's hard to stay bias-free. I like to think of myself as a skeptic, and I am a skeptic, but I could struggle to be skeptical about my skepticism. I think I was a little too eager to embrace Aronowitz's skepticism about regular testing. Now, a lot of that was going on in my head, but I worried some of that skepticism or embrace of his skepticism may have come out in the conversation. I may have been too strong. I might have encouraged some of you, I worried, to think that 
uh, that the evidence is more black and white than it really is. So I want to make it clear here. Looking at the evidence is always a good idea, but the evidence is almost always murkier than advocates on either side of an issue will concede when we're looking at complex issues such as health or economics, for that matter. The numbers rarely speak for themselves. There are always questions of interpretation, leaps of faith in trying to measure some variables, along with the issue of confounding effects from additional variables that often go unmeasured. Inevitably, assessing risk is very complicated. Thanks for listening. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.